Hey fam, welcome back to the channel and part two of listening to me yap my face off about Stephen King. Basically. I think that's fair. That's pretty fair. I'm just gonna yap. Right. So previously was my top 10 of those that I have read over the decades, which Man, I absolutely agree. Like, how do you choose? How do you even choose? And how do you choose when it's like, Wait. there's more? There's forever more. There's always more. Today, we're gonna go over the top 10 books that I'm looking forward to reading and I just haven't quite gotten around to it yet because I probably took that shit for granted or something. And then they made a fucking movie and I was like, shit. So yeah, like truth be told, I didn't know how to come up with these lists either until I decided to do the first video and the next thing I know I'm on to part two and I don't know what's happening. <laughs> so we're just gonna roll. Number one on the list of books I need to stop slacking on is The Dead Zone. <laughs> I watched the first season of that series with Anthony and Michael Hall, right? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go with the yeah. Um, it wasn't bad. I liked it. I'm trying to remember. I can't remember if I watched the movie. I don't think so. But it was the '80s. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, so the synapses. Johnny, the small boy who skated at breakneck speed into an accident that, for one horrifying moment, plunged him into the dead zone. Johnny Smith the small town school teacher who spun the wheel of fortune and won a four and a half year trip into the dead zone. John Smith, who awakened from an interminable coma with an accursed power, the power to see the future and the terrible fate awaiting mankind in the dead zone. <laughs> that should, you know, that's just, that's right up my damn alley. I know I've been slacking on this most recent ghostly story time, Honestly, I think I'm just gonna refilm it. Anyway, moving on. But you know, I love my ghost shit. I love my like, that kind of shit. That's right up my alley. Anyway, moving on, number two. <laughs> that, of course it's number two, because I've been meaning to read this book what feels like my entire life. Okay, yeah, and that's the stand. I told you we were gonna get to it. I just, mm, that is, so, mm, there's just, mm. <laughs> It's so intimidating. <laughs> Am I supposed to read the abridged version or something? No. That's just like, that's a relationship, fam. The synapses. This is the way the world ends with a nanosecond of computer error and a defense department. Let's try that again. This is the way the world ends with a nanosecond of computer error in a defense department laboratory and a measure. I just like blending words sometimes, okay? This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. With a nanosecond of computer error in a defense department laboratory and a million casual contacts that form the links in a chain letter of death. And here is the bleak new world of the day after. A world stripped of its institutions and emptied of 99% of its people. A world in which a handful of panicky survivors choose sides or are chosen. I just feel sorry for everyone that had anything to do with this most recent project. I'm sorry that they did this to you. It's not the act, I haven't watched it, so I guess I should shut my mouth. But I just, I've seen the cast, like I have faith in them. I don't know what went wrong. I haven't watched it, I haven't read it, I'll get to it. I'm gonna trust you guys, because none of you have had a single good thing to say about it. It's like, oh, <laughs> oh. I watched the very beginning of that OG series, miniseries, right? And I just, 
I want to read it and then I'll watch it. That's how I do. That's how I prefer it. So it's just, it's something that I keep like on the back burner that I always intend to. And then like, am I gonna be mad if I die before? Okay, that one I might be upset with myself over because I've been meaning to read it my whole life. <laughs> Some of these I do have right over here. I did a recent video called Summer Reads where I go over the books I intend to read that are part of my plans for pretty much the rest of the summer and probably beyond because I haven't been reading worth a damn this week. It just, I don't know, I'm just not feeling these books and one is just fucking with my head. Moving on, please. <laughs> Okie dokie, so number three on this freaking list. I think I've watched the movie like way back in the day when it first hit cable, but I have no memory of it, so fuck it. And that's The Dark Half. That is one of the books that are back, that's like over there or something. I think it's, it's there. Thad Beaumont would like to say he is innocent. He'd like to say he has nothing to do with a series of monstrous murders that keep coming closer to his home. But how can Thad disown the ultimate disembodiment of evil that goes by the name he gave it and signs his crimes with Thad's bloody fingerprints? I don't know, dude, you're fucked. No. I feel like the way I walked, like the movie was kind of you know, it was more like I was younger and I was just watching whatever the fuck Stephen King shit I possibly could. I feel that way about the Dark Calf movie. So I want to read it because I bet it's a bajillion times better. Just call it a hunch. No offense to Timothy Hutton or anything because dude's good, but uh, mm. So I'm sorry for the repetition to anyone who has watched the previous Summer Reads video already and you already know this shit. But <laughs> number four is The Tommyknockers, which is one of the books in there that I plan on. I picked it up years ago, like 2014 or something like that, 2013, 2014. And I set it down, not meaning to release it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, there you go, I'll just fuck it. Um, so I've been meaning to pick it back up ever since and I'm gonna fucking do it. It's happening. We shall see. Something was happening in Bobby Anderson's idyllic small town of Haven, Maine. Something that gave every man, woman, and child in town powers far beyond ordinary mortals. Something that turned the town into a death trap for all outsiders. Something that came from a metal object buried for millennia that Bobby accidentally stumbled across. It wasn't that Bobby and the other good folks of Haven had sold their souls to reap the rewards of the most deadly evil this side of hell. It was more a diabolical takeover, an invasion of body and soul and mind. Dude, seriously, I don't know why I put it down. I was enjoying it. What the fuck? It is time to rectify that shit. All right. So. Wait a minute, did I just see Tommyknockers movie 2019? Okie dokie, number five is yet another oldie but goodie that I plan on reading within the next couple of months. And this one is Gerald's Game. I have been holding off on the Netflix series until I read this damn book. I'm fucking gonna read it. It's gonna happen. I swear it's gonna happen. I have all the good intentions. All right. I read like the first chapter or something. It was like, eh, and I just wasn't in the mood for that shit at the time. So I figured eventually I'll be in the mood and it just has not come. So I'm gonna try again. All right. If you don't know, about Gerald's game, Stephen King cranks up the suspense in a different kind of bedtime story. A game of seduction between a husband and wife goes horribly awry when the husband dies, but the nightmare has just begun. Fucking A. And that, like, that opening scene. Fuck. Number six is Duma Key. I feel like I had no idea what this book was about for this like whole time. And it's, now I really want to read it. It's 
kind of funny that since it came out and all this time of like looking at it, shelving it and not knowing what the fuck's going on. And now I've gone through like the psych 101 kind of like shit and uh, right off the bat, it's like, oh, hey. <laughs> so this one's for all the psych students out there. A terrible construction site accident takes Edgar Fremantle. What the fuck was that sound? You heard that, right? A terrible construction site accident takes Edgar Fremantle's right arm and scrambles his memory and his mind leaving him with little but rage as he begins the ordeal of rehabilitation. A marriage that produced two lovely daughters suddenly ends, and Edgar begins to wish he hadn't survived the injuries that could have killed him. He wants out. His psychologist, I'm going to pronounce it Dr. Kamen, suggests a geographic cure. A new life distant from the Twin Cities and the building business Edgar grew from scratch and came in suggests something else. Edgar, does anything make you happy? I used to sketch. Take it up again. You need hedges. Hedges against the night. Edgar leaves Minnesota for a rented house on Duma Key, a stunningly beautiful eerily undeveloped splinter of the Florida coast. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, Pinky? Sure, Blaine, but how are we gonna find chaps our size? The sun setting into the Gulf of Mexico and the tidal rattling of shells on the beach call out to him. And Edgar draws. A visit from Ilsa, the daughter he dotes on, starts his movement out of solitude. He meets a kindred spirit in Wireman, a man reluctant to reveal his own wounds, and then Elizabeth Eastlake, a sick old woman whose roots are tangled deep in Dumaki. Now Edgar paints, sometimes feverishly, his exploding talent both a wonder and a weapon. Many of his paintings have a power that cannot be controlled. When Elizabeth's past unfolds, and the ghosts of her childhood begin to appear, the damage of which they are capable of is truly devastating. The tenacity of love, the perils of creativity, the mysteries of memory, and the nature of the supernatural. Stephen King gives us a novel as fascinating as it is gripping and terrifying. Ooh, 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 so. That's one of my favorite things, especially since like having fun going down like the Psych 101, like rabbit hole um, is like psychological thrillers and stuff like that. Like, is this all in the person's head or the character's head or is shit really happening? I fucking love that shit. As long as you do it right. <laughs> it's my opinion. Wait, what? Okay, with number seven, we're right back to my soon to be red pile, and that is Salem's Lot. Now, there's something that I watched recently. Why won't you do the thing? It won't do the thing. It won't show me more. Show me more. Thank you. Okay, now, I panic started to read this. When was that? Do you know when? Do you remember exactly when that was? It was at least a couple years ago, wasn't it? But I don't think it was necessary because I had no fucking idea. So <laughs> it worked out and it gave me some slack. And now I'm like, this one and the dead zone, as far as like the old, old ones go, are the only ones that I need to read. How? How have I? How? How? How has this happened? How have I yet to read these particulars? It's okay. I have no excuse, okay? I have no excuse. I've read every whatever. I'll get to it within the next couple of months. Sure. Thousands of miles away from the small township of Salem's Lot, two terrified people, man and a boy, still share the secrets of those clapboard houses and tree-lined streets. They must return to Salem's Lot for a final confrontation 
with the unspeakable evil that lives on in the town. This keeps reminding me of that, uh, you know that show like celebrity ghost stories and stuff, there's a dude who, were they on vacation or something? Him and his wife like went to some little town in Europe or whatever the fuck, we're like. They're all walking at a particular pace. The, the most noticeable thing was no talking. That was uh, strange. And their lack of eye contact. They look like extras in a movie uh, of, of uh, Night of the Living Dead. Stuff like, that's what that synopsis reminds me of. The only thing I can think of with any of these is I've just been taking them for granted. They're, where are they going? They're not going anywhere. There are so fucking many additions. It's fine. So they make 50,000 fucking movies and I'm like, damn it. So this one, I read an interview. Was it from Rue Morgue? Ru, Ru, is it Rue Morgue or just Rue Morgue? I just want to make it super French, don't I? Uh, there's something people tend to say about Stephen King endings probably about like similar to what I say about Skeleton Crew right and when I read this review in Rue Morgue I have a stack of them right there but they're like over there man and freaking the person said that this was like his favorite ending of all Stephen King books I think those may not have been his exact words, but he really fucking talked it up. And I was like, okay, that was like one of those life hashtag life moments where this review was from back when it first came out. But the conversation I had about Stephen King endings with coworkers happened a couple of years ago. And it coincidentally was right before I picked up this issue of the magazine. I was like, <laughs> so ever since then, I've been like, I need to read Revival. I really, really need to read Revival. What the fuck am I waiting for? I don't, I don't, I don't know what I'm waiting for on any of these. Okay. I just need to just make a blanket statement and just plow through this shit and save us all some time. All right. In a small New England town in the early 60s, a shadow falls over a small boy playing with his toy soldiers. Jamie Morton looks up to see a striking man, a new minister. Charles Jacobs, along with his beautiful wife, will transform the local church. The men and boys are all a bit in love with Mrs. Jacobs. The women and girls, including Jamie's mother and beloved sister, feel the same about Reverend Jacobs. With Jamie, the Reverend shares a deeper bond based on their fascination with simple experiments in electricity. And then tragedy strikes the Jacobs family. The preacher curses God, mocking all religious belief and is banished from the shock town. Jamie has demons of his own. In his mid thirties, he is living a nomadic lifestyle of bar band rock and roll, addicted to heroin, stranded, Desperate, he sees Jacobs again, a showman on stage, creating dazzling portraits in lightning, and their meeting has profound consequences for both men. Their bond becomes a pact beyond even the devil's devising, and Jamie discovers that revival has many meanings, because for every cure, there is a price. This rich, and disturbing novel spans five decades on its way to the most terrifying conclusion Stephen King has ever written. It's a masterpiece from King in the great American tradition of Nathaniel Hawthorne. I don't consider that a compliment. Fuck that guy. And Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, you got me there. I like Poe. It's not down here, which I'm, I've surprised myself with, but I do own the copy, so it's over there. And it's like... I got like my three Pennywises that so they're like set in front of it with this like glass earth art piece thing just looking at it you know and I'm not going over there okay the next one I'm gonna put up here even though it's literally right behind me and the easiest one that I could grab of all of them but I want you to see this cover because it's really fucking pretty <laughs> I'm very concerned and that's why I've taken my time with reading this one because I'm holding it a bit at arm's length because I don't want to be disappointed like 
those particulars in it. I just, I don't want it. Number nine is elevation. I'm wary. I'm just wary, okay? I don't, don't piss me off, Steve. Although Scott Carey doesn't look any different, he's been steadily losing weight. There are a couple of other odd things too. He weighs the same in his clothes and out of them, no matter how heavy they are. Scott doesn't want to be poked and prodded. He mostly just wants someone else to know. And he trusts Dr. Bob Ellis. In the small town of Castle Rock, the setting of many of King's most iconic stories, Scott is engaged in a low grade but escalating battle with the lesbians next door whose dog regularly drops his business on Scott's lawn. One of the women is friendly, the other cold as ice. Both are trying to launch a new restaurant, but the people of Castle Rock want no part of a gay married couple, and the place is in trouble. When Scott finally understands the prejudices they face, including his own, he tries to help. Unlikely alliances, the annual foot race, and the mystery of Scott's affect. <laughs> I keep wanting to say affection, and it fucks me up every time, no matter how many times I practice. But it's affliction. Fuck it, we're rolling with it. Bring out the best in people who have indulged the worst in themselves and others. Don't let me down, Uncle Steve. Okay, <laughs> like I don't. <sighs> I just feel like this is gonna be the maybe it. And I don't want it to be. Alright. Number 10 is one of is the one collection of short stories that I've been eyeballing ever since it came out. I'm terrified of flying, so it's not that shit. Fuck that. I'm good. I read Joe Hill's um, it's good. Although the one about the clouds was pretty like I love clouds. That's the only way I try to fly during the daylight if I can. And I just geek out on my clouds or I watch shit or I read shit or do you know how many pictures I'm going to land with? I don't because the sky's the limit. <laughs> I like to make jokes too. All right. That is If It Bleeds. My little kitty. <laughs> so this is a collection of four uniquely wonderful long stories. I don't, I don't know. Like... I mean, those are stories. <laughs> the top three books are collections. <laughs> God damn it. Anyway, a collection of four uniquely wonderful long stories, including a standalone sequel to The Outsider. News people have a saying, if it bleeds, it leads. That's nice. And a bomb at Albert McCready Middle School is guaranteed to lead any bulletin. Holly Gibney of the Finders Keepers Detective Agency is working on the case of a missing dog and on her own need to be more assertive when she sees the footage on TV. But when she tunes in again to the late night report, she realizes there is something not quite right about the correspondent who was first on the scene. So begins, if it bleeds, a standalone sequel to The Outsider featuring the incomparable Holly on her first solo case. Dancing alongside are three more long stories, Mr. Harrigan's Phone, The Life of Chuck, and Rat. The novella is a form King has returned to over and over again in the course of his amazing career, and many have been made into iconic films. If It Bleeds is a uniquely satisfying collection of longer short fiction by an incomparably gifted writer. And that kitty's been clickbaiting me ever since release. I was working at the store and was like, you motherfucker. All right. So there you go, fam. That's it. Those are my top 10 of the books that I'm really looking forward to reading. I dusted and my freaking nose is so stuffy right now. Please forgive. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wanted it to look nice for you, okay? I spiffed up the place. And uh, yeah, now I got nothing left. <laughs> Thank you again for sitting through my babble. You do it so well. Seriously, you just keep coming back and putting up with me. I love you. <laughs> Till next time, fam and beyond, please take care. And I will try as well.